twenty dollars. No picture. The mission of Active Claremont is to advocate communication and understanding between Claremont citizens and the local government to promote public awareness and uh, of interest in local issues and to ensure a spirit of volunteerism in the Claremont community. Uh, this time, I'd like everyone to stand if you're able to for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, it's my honor at this time to introduce our most famous mayor. Oh, I'm sucking up really good. Mr. Edwards. Thanks, Bill. The, uh, well, I tell you, it's really an honor to be here today, uh, not only as serving as your mayor, this year, but also uh, being a member of Active Claremont. And uh, so I am happy to be here and introduce such an amazing, amazing person and that serves as well, uh, serves this community as well. Supervisor Captain Barger serves the residents of the 5th District, Los Angeles County's largest, spanning 2,785 square miles, including 20 cities and 83 unincorporated communities in the San Gabriel Valley, in the San Fernando, in Crescenta, Antelope, and Santa Clarita, Santa Clarita Valleys. Catherine was born and raised in the 5th District and comes from a family with deep roots in public service. She's married to a retired sheriff's deputy and lives in the San Gabriel Valley. Dedicated to providing effective, responsive representation to the residents of Los Angeles County, Catherine began, began her career in public service as a college intern in the office of former supervisor Antonovich and rose to become his chief deputy in 2001, where she served until her election to the Board of Supervisors in 2016. She both served as chair of the board and was reelected for a second term in 2020. Building upon her work from her time as chief policy advisor on health, mental health, social services, and children's issues, Catherine continues to advocate for services and programs to improve the quality of life for foster children, seniors, veterans, and those with disabilities and those with mental illness. Catherine is committed to keeping our neighborhoods and communities safe, working with federal leaders, law enforcement officials, and judicial officers to implement vital public safety initiatives. She is an advocate for the environment and has spearheaded efforts to preserve open space and enhance parks, trails, and recreational programs and facilities, as well as libraries and after-school programs to serve local communities. She has hosted several trail rides and hikes to connect with the community throughout her district. With a strong, strong sense of fiscal responsibility, Catherine is dedicated to providing vital county services while protecting financial resources as a responsible steward of taxpayer dollars. Catherine serves on the boards of Metrolink, Los Angeles County Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the North County Transportation Coalition, High Desert Corridor Joint Powers Authority, the National Association of Counties Large Urban County Caucus, and Commission on Mental Health and Well-Being, Southern California Association of Governments, the Sanitation Districts of Los Angeles County, California State Association of Counties, and the Local Agency Formation Commission. You know, I'm, I'm also served on a number of boards and uh, organizations, but wow, she has me topped. She, that's fantastic. It's all about time management. Uh, with that, I want to introduce Supervisor Catherine Barber. I'm going to go down about an inch because I'm taking off one of my shoes. My feet are killing me. I've been on my feet all day, um, so please forgive me. I'm not going to do it in front of you all, but I do have a pedicure. So the good news is my feet look decent, but you're not going to see them. <laughs> First of all, good evening. It is a pleasure to be here. I've reconnected with, you're not old, but with friends that I've not seen in a long time. 
and gotten to reconnect with an incredible city council here in Claremont, who I um, worked with when I was a deputy, um, not before I was elected. Um, and then when we got redistricted back in, um, the last redistricting process, I got Claremont back. And I laughed because we were just talking, and I'm one of these people that I do love to, to hike, but I also like to walk around neighborhoods, and so it's not unusual for me on a Saturday or Sunday to be walking around Claremont with a ponytail and a baseball cap and no makeup, and what you see is what you get. And I don't make any apologies for it, but I get to know the community and um, really understand it. And actually, it's Claremont where I fell in love with Chico's, and so I don't know whether to thank you or curse you. Um, great clothing store, by the way. Um, so I've been told there's a couple of things we want to talk about, and I want to get right into the discussion because um, I know that there are people here who have questions about especially housing elements. I'm going to start though with the gold mine. Um, finishing the gold mine extension has long been a priority of mine, even before I was elected as supervisor. And the question is not if, it's when we're going to get it done and bring in the funding. Um, one of the unique things about the gold mine is that there is no federal dollars, so it is not eligible for any federal transportation dollars, so it's got to all come from taxes that we have here that we've already self-taxed ourselves, but also from the state. And we're competing with a lot of projects with 2028 um, and the Olympics coming. Uh, we definitely um, are near the home stretch, wouldn't you agree? I think I am confident we're gonna get it done and we'll have the gold line um, in place and it is a priority, it's a number one priority for Metro right now um, as it relates to all the applications we make to the state. Um, so when it's eligible for the state funding, it'll be our number one priority. And with that, you will be able to actually get on here and take this all the way down to Long Beach um, with, with no switching trains because we are now got a connector downtown that's gonna be opened in about a month. Um, we'll allow you to have one seat all the way down. Um, so if you want to go to Long Beach or anything in between, you'll be able to do it. Um, I'm working with the, the Gold Mine Board, but also with our state representatives to bring this project home. Um, and for those of you that are concerned about Metrolink, I sit on Metrolink as well. And they serve two distinct populations. And I'm not going to allow them to compete with each other. I think that there are people that depend upon Metrolink to get to and from work. Um, we're definitely not at ridership where it was pre-COVID, but it is not going to be in place of Metrolink. Metrolink will still play um, a, 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 an important part as it relates to our transportation infrastructure. The Gold Line is just going to give you another opportunity um, as it relates to access to transportation. So stay tuned and please stay engaged in this issue. Uh, I'm excited, and I think it's an exciting time. And speaking of the local projects at Gold Line, how many of you have heard of 740 Foothill Boulevard? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, I, want, I want to talk about that. Um, there's a public hearing tomorrow night. Um, done at my request, but unfortunately should have been done sooner, but um, it is happening tomorrow night. The district staff was made aware of the proposed award of funding to the project on April 7, 2023, and was told the funding would be before the Board of Supervisors for action on April 18, 2023. This is a $35 million project, and what the county has done is we put pooled housing money, about $70 million a year, and what we do is we allow profit, nonprofits and, and housing uh, groups that are providing affordable housing to apply for grants. This project at 740 Foothill Boulevard applied for a grant and was recommended an award of $7 million. My staff and I take full responsibility, uh, and so I say my staff, but it's really on me, not my staff, but my staff and I, failed to appropriately communicate with the cities of San Dimas and Laverne to make them aware that this project is potentially being awarded funds and the board would be acting on it on April 18th. This was and is a significant oversight on the part of my office, and we have apologized for the lack of communication with the cities. To allow work, but, but having said that, we did notify the cities about the project, just not about the uh, awarding of the NOFA funding. To allow more time for discussion about the project, including the robust community engagement process, 
I postponed the potential award of the $7 million. I initially postponed it until May 16th, but it will now return to the board at a later date if the community participates and provides input as it relates to this project. And I say engagement in the community is vital. I feel it is so important that it be a ground up approach. And I, I don't know about y'all, because I am a supervisor, but I'm also a taxpayer. And I think that projects are better when they start at the ground versus someone at the top telling you how it's going to be done. My staff has been had conversations with National Corps, who is the organization that's proposing this, and they have agreed to engage the community through multiple meetings to fully brief them on the details of the proposed project, both in person and virtually. I think they've had two virtual meetings, and tomorrow night will be the in-person meeting. Um, Although this project is allowed to move forward without local approval, National Corps granted my request for the project to exclusively serve seniors, a demographic that has been growing significantly in recent years. We have the homeless count coming in, and what we're finding is that seniors are, the number of homeless that are seniors is growing. And in part, it's because, and this is, this is let me get on the soapbox now, but you know, we talk about rent control. Rent control, caps how much you can increase someone's rent. They don't talk about SSI and how that is not increasing. So seniors are being priced out of housing and there is not um, enough housing um, to accommodate those that are in need. So CORE has agreed to limit the demographics um, to seniors only. They've also heard community feedback and redesigned the project to address community concerns. Core agreed to reduce the project by one story from five to four, and reduced it further on the back of the project down from five to three, adjacent to the single family home behind the project. Core is also relocating their driveway next to the adjacent Montessori school to provide a greater buffer along with greater setbacks along the rear of the property. I just want to make it clear, and I think it's important for everyone to hear this. Due to recent changes in state law, this project is subject to buy right and is not required to have any public hearings. And I want to emphasize that. Um, the seven million that is being withheld from the county right now is only one part of the money that they're using to build this project. Buy right takes away local control and takes away our voice. And I know you all, I was just talking with your mayor, are facing the same dilemma here in Claremont. But this is not the only project where we've got buy right taking place. Additionally, because this is the buy right approval, the Regional Planning Commission and the LA County Board of Supervisors, of which I sit, do not have discretion over the approval of this project. This is private property being sold to someone who wants to develop land based on their ability by right if they provide a threshold of affordable housing to circumvent all local regulations. This project has not been given land use approval through Los Angeles County's Department of Regional Planning. And I want to emphasize that because I think people are confused. This has not gone through regional planning. It has not come before our board. The only thing that's come before our board was a recommendation for a grant that they applied for for affordable, or for um, the ANOPA uh, funds. With respect to the ANOPA funds, this action will take place once, and I say once, there's sufficient outreach and engagement with the community. I've been with the county for 35 years and I've worked on projects throughout the 5th District when I was a chief of staff. If a community is not involved, in my opinion and from what I've seen, projects will not succeed. And I'm not saying you kill it, I'm talking about a project that has community support is far better placed and a far better better uh, uh, situation to succeed for those that are living in that environment. And uh, my hope is that there will be some sort of agreement, whatever that is, we'll see, I'm open-minded, but in the end, I'm working with CORE, but it's gonna be CORE's ultimate decision what they do, and I hope they do the right thing. Um, with respect to um, the process, I am committed to being transparent with the unincorporated community where this project is located 
as well as the cities of San Dimas and Laverne. Because this is unincorporated, it's like a little sliver of unincorporated between San Dimas and Laverne. In terms of the unincorporated areas of Claremont, I have directed the Department of Regional Planning to inform my office immediately when there are applications for by right or ministerial projects that are taking place. So we are now trying to be more proactive as we find out about them. Um, and, the, and usually the way we find out, and I've got a niche here, it might have to nod or like this if I'm right or wrong, but we will find out about a project if they apply for a NOVA funding because they don't have to apply for any conditional use permit or anything. So by the time they apply for a NOVA, um, they know now in my office, if you are going to apply and you've not done outreach or had community engagement, um, it'll be done on arrival. Um, that's, just, that's just the way it's going to be, and I think the other board offices are also um, adopting that as well. It's been my priority to always engage the community on issues that impact them. When it comes to homelessness, that commitment remains the same. Local government must be a good partner to our neighbors and engage in them for solutions. I think, again, homelessness, we've just got our count. We're at 60,000. And I would say that probably 50% are within the city of LA. So, I mean, that is ground zero for the homeless issue. I feel that in each community, who better knows how to address the homeless than the people that are elected to do it within their cities? We've got 88 cities. And I work closely with our cities, and we've got this thing called Measure H. And Measure H is uh, a tax that I think if before the voters in the near future would not pass. Because people don't feel like they're seeing any return on the money being sent in for Measure H. So one of the things I did was I said, and LA City was getting line share of it. So I actually brought in a motion and asked for a blueprint commission because I personally think we should pivot what we're doing, we should pivot what we're not doing well, and what we're doing well, expand and spread. But we weren't doing that. We had no data to show what the returns were for the work we're doing on the homeless population. So through Measure H, and the city, by the way, I'm looking over to the city, the city manager will tell you, didn't have a say so either. So if you were sending $100,000 in revenue into the county, if you got a thousand back, you'd be lucky. And yet your need, if you submitted a plan for outreach, whether working with law enforcement and doing outreach to the homeless populations in the areas, um, it was, you'd have to do it with your own dime. It, you were paying into the system. And I felt that was unfair, and quite frankly, um, you know, I think that that is undermining um, what Measure H was voted on and what the, what the voters thought they were getting. Uh, so now I'm pleased to say that cities do have a seat at the table, and we are working together to make sure that the money is brought into the city. It's not going to be dollar for dollar, but at least if the city of Claremont brings in a proposal, and I keep saying for outreach because I really believe robust outreach works, um, that they will be allocated funding so it doesn't come through the general funds that the city has. It comes through Measure H, which is that's exactly what it was intended for. Um, it also comes with housing. Um, housing is under 88 cities. The county's charge is services, mental health, social services, job training, um, any service that is a social service. Cities are in charge of the housing side of it, um, and and so we work together to address that issue, and um, you know, I think that, that in many cities, they are struggling with the fact that there are homeless, but not significant numbers, but there are homeless, and the community does not want them to build housing to address it in their community. And what I have encouraged, and I will continue to encourage, is that cities coordinate and collaborate to come up with a solution so it is a regional approach versus a one city, because I think regional works better. And you can leverage both services and dollars <clears throat> by doing so. And, uh, and that's something that the Council of Governments um, is, is working on, not just in San Diego Valley, but across the whole LA County region. Um, when I talk about mental health, 
I tell people, housing is, alone is not going to get us out of this mess. Mental health and substance abuse are issues that need to be addressed in order to address the homeless. You're not going to build your way out of this. And, you know, when uh, you, you've talked about my bio, I mean, actually, and not all those commissions meet all the time, so I, I do have time to be a supervisor. And one of the things that I'm on is the mental health and well-being. And uh, my main priority right now is to build capacity. We Right now, if you talk to, and I'm looking over at my former police chief of Pasadena, who I adore, um, if Pasadena PD wanted to 5150 or uh, hospitalize someone, to find a bed is, is a chore. Because there's not a lot of mental health beds available. And people say, well, why is that? Why don't you just build them? The answer is simple. Um, a long, long time ago, there was a goal to get rid of mental health hospitals. And the way you get rid of mental health hospitals is what? Close. Cut the funding. Well, you close them, but the only way you close them is you cut the funding. The last hospital in California was Cambria. And if you have a facility of 16 or more beds, you do not get federal or state reimbursement. And it's called an IMD, it's an IMD. It, um, it's been a long day. It's a, Yes, she yelled it. Institutional, Institutional Mental Disease Bed, IMD. And as a result, we don't have capacity to house those that are languishing on the streets. And in the county that we were getting around it is, at our, at our hospital um, campuses, we're building separate units of 16 beds. So in all of you, we've got five buildings with 16 beds each to circumvent the law. Which is, if you're in private business, you know that is not the best way to leverage your resources. Especially when we have a limited resource pool to draw from right now. Because we don't have a lot of professionals going into mental health services. And we're competing with the private sector, we're competing with correctional institutions. Mental health services are on, the, the need for them is increasing and the number of individuals working in that field is decreasing, and so we are struggling. Um, so one of the things that we're doing, and I'm doing, is pushing the federal government to do an IMD waiver. And that waiver will allow us to work with the private sector to build bed capacity and not get dinged if they go over 16 beds so they can actually get reimbursed, because mental health services are very expensive to provide especially hospitalization. But with the waiver, will also allow us to put together board and cares, which are slowly being sold because the current reimbursement rate is $35 a day, and that's for including services and food, um, and that is not sustainable. And then the ones that do operate on that, I can't even imagine the services they provide, but it's not quality services. So with this IMD waiver, um, the state has to apply, and I have every hope that the state is going to. And if we get the waiver, we'll be able to build capacity so that we get individuals, especially who's heard of the governor's care court that he's putting together, okay. Um, say what you want about politics, but I will say that 10 years ago, if I had brought up conservatorship or mental health legislation, every elected would have run out of the room. No one wanted to touch it. It was, it was persona non grata as it relates to legislation. Now, people recognize that if we don't do anything about mental health, um, we're not gonna, we'll, we'll, the numbers are gonna grow on the street. In part because of, uh, I believe, um, substance abuse um, on the rise. And so, um, working with uh, our communities, the goal is to um, do the conservatorship where we need to, but also provide services for the chronically mentally ill, get them into the hospital stabilized and into housing, supportive housing, so they don't recycle back onto the street. It's not gonna happen overnight, and this is not a silver bullet, but I believe it's a step in the right direction. That's why I say housing alone will not solve this problem. If you place some of these individuals in housing, as a housing first model, they're gonna be back on the street in no time, 
and they're going to be even more service resistant. So I truly do believe the only way to address this population is to do wraparound services that do hospitalization, board and care across the board um, to address them. And I also believe that is the case with substance abuse as well. Um, I think that, that if you talk to many, many of the individuals are what I call, I call it dual diagnosis, it's a different term now, but I can't change it. It's dual diagnosis where they are self-medicating. They are both have mental health issues and also are dependent upon drugs. Uh, and so we need, to, we need to set up a system that addresses that as well. Recognizing that if we don't, these are people that are just gonna end up back on the street and are gonna be service resistance, which we're already seeing. Because with the current um, hospitalization and the way it, it works now, they're in and out in 72 hours. And they become pretty sophisticated on how to avoid getting 5150, but they also, um, uh, become more um, more noticeable in the community um, in terms of their illness because they start to decompensate even more. So um, that is my commitment to address the mental health side of, of the homeless issue. Um, I want to also, I'm looking at what y'all want me to talk about, so that I, the drug, drug epidemic, I was talking about that. And, you know, my frustration is fentanyl. Um, I've got a lot of frustration, but fentanyl for sure. We need to emphasize this. This is not an overdose. One pill will kill. And yesterday, I was at Barry Nidor, which is our juvenile hall. And I went over there because um, they had been sneaking in um, drugs. And we had one overdose and death at the hall. And I found out that uh, an individual had overdosed twice. And Narcan brought this individual back. Um, and I was talking to him. And I said, you know, if you know you almost died, why are you doing this? And he said, I cannot stop. I cannot stop because of the addiction. The addiction overrides the common sense knowing that one of those pills could be laced with fentanyl and you could die if they don't get to you in time. In LA County, fentanyl deaths have more than doubled since 2019. And um, last year, there were 562 deaths. In 2021, um, there were overdoses were about 1,500. And we're seeing the numbers continue to go up, especially among those on the street. I believe it is completely unacceptable, and I firmly believe we must do better. The county has responded to this uh, aggressively partnering with local stakeholders, schools, parents, local law enforcement, and medical professionals. If you had told me five years ago that I'd be carrying Narcan in my car, I would have told you there's no way. But I do, I have Narcan in my car. Um, if I need it, better to have it. Narcan is used when someone overdoses. It's like a pump, like, like a spray mist up your nose, and it goes into the brain. I really don't know what it does other than it reverses the effect of fentanyl and saves lives. Um, but we are now going into schools and it, talking to parents and teaching them how to use Narcan in case their child, who by the way, is not an addict. There are kids that think they go to parties and they think one pill, what's it gonna do? It could kill you, it could kill you. But I could sit there and tell these kids not to do it. But they're gonna look at me like, what, what are you old lady telling me? You don't know what I'm, you're talking about. So we're doing peer-to-peer -peer counseling with students, so it's student to student, allowing students to put together PSAs, um, because who better to tell their peer the dangers than someone who is at that same level and understands what is going to make sense. Um, we're working with public health, um, who has put together toolkits for parents, teachers, and administrators. And they've also joined schools for town halls with parents and students. Again, we literally, up in Santa Clarita, had a town hall, and we had the room nearly full from parents who wanted to understand how to use Narcan. We handed it out. Parents were shown how to use it and took home kits with them. Who ever thought we'd get to this point where that's what we are doing now to protect our children? Um, 
But I do believe to help stem the tide, we need to cut off supply and availability of this drug. We are relying on federal partners at the borders because it is coming over the borders. Make no mistake, it is being smuggled in across the border. Locally, the DA is cracking down on distribution chains. Additionally, the Sheriff's Department is leading enforcement and response. And Sheriff Luna has been incredible, recognizing that this is a priority and has put together um, a, a group to, to uh, focus on this and go for the dealers and the people that are distributing it on the street. But fentanyl isn't the only drug we're facing. Ziacine is a drug that is now rearing its ugly head in the county. This drug has been FDA approved for use in animals as a sedative and pain reliever for use in vet 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 veterinarian setting. We are still learning about it and its use as a narcotic. When it's mixed with fentanyl, it forms an even more dangerous and deadly combo. Still, this is an FDA approved drug because it is common to be used with veterinarians. The county does not have an authority to make it illegal. So the Sheriff's Department has launched a new program to track the prevalence um, and source of the drug because we're seeing it get more and more into young people's hands. And we need to understand where it is coming from and we need federal action to better control the flow. Public health is messaging, messaging about the risk of using it in tandem with fentanyl messaging. If we want to address this issue, it's going to take collaboration. I believe with every major issue, we have to work together. With that, I'd like to share a few things about public safety partners and working together to tackle the crisis of human trafficking, which is directly impacting this community as we speak. Claremont's proximity to the Interstate 10 serves as a prime transportation corridor for traffickers to easily move their victims across the county and state lines. And actually, Sal Medina, when I first took over um, as supervisor for Claremont, invited me to walk, I think you walked with me, Vicki, walk the community um, around the area where there were problems existing. And we spent the day, well, half the day walking, and he educated me about some of the concerns with some of the motels in the area. We've been in, con connect we've been in um, contact and, and communication with the Sheriff's Department regarding concerns with hotels near the I-10. The LA County, um, just for your information, has the largest co-located task force in the nation, which was created in 2015. Their partners include the Sheriff, Probation, LAPD, CHP, DCFS, District Attorney, Homeland Security, FBI, and many more, all housed under one roof. They meet monthly and discuss how they collaborate to try to leverage all resources to address this issue. And we're talking, I mean, to tell you how, how horrible the, the individuals are that are trafficking these women, we had an emergency shelter for foster youth. They sent a child, well I say a child 17, but that's me as a child, in as a victim of abuse to recruit the girls that were in our emergency shelter. And then took them out and they became, not all, but the ones that they could recruit. And by the way, many of them were, were ripe for the picking because they were in there, they were unhappy they were in there, and they wanted to get out. And they're promised, you know, all these great things that you're promised, and then they find that they are now literally slaves to human trafficking. So that tells you how they're going about doing it. And for people that think the gang are now focused on drug trafficking, they've moved to a more lucrative business, and that is sex trafficking. This is an industry that has taken off. And this task force goal is to address those that are buying it, and holding them accountable to every extent of the law. But in doing so, we're putting together programs to deal with the women that we're finding, especially those that are underage, which many of them are, and putting them in a place where we can literally deprogram them. So that's what it takes. You have to deprogram them of the life that they have been living. Uh, and so our probation department, in collaboration with DCFS, is has had a program working with those women that we've rescued, and men actually, and boys, that we've rescued off the street um, that had been uh, sex trafficked. Uh, I understand that there was an operation conducted by Claremont PD 
and the DA's office in January where 16 individuals were arrested for solicitation. They were later released on citations with a pending court appearance at the Pomona Superior Court. The PD and DA will continue to monitor the area and I have promised Sal and the city that we will collaborate and work with you because this is not a victimless crime. Um, this impacts the community, impacts the, the people being trafficked and, uh, and I am committed to holding those responsible and, and I say those that are purchasing the services accountable. We are, um, let me see where I'm, I'm talked about that. I want to, and I know that, that we talked about this, you know, I want to hear from you all. And one of the things I've said, and, and I know Rich is here, he's a frequent flyer in our office. It's good to finally meet you in person. Um, and I mean that in a nice way. Um, I think the most frustrating thing to me, and I'm sure to the city representatives, is that you all, and, and I work for Antonovich, who would say if someone calls up and they have a problem, and it's a federal problem, do not tell them, here's a number for your federal representative, call them. You take their name and number and then you call the federal representative and then have them call the individual back. Those were wise words because people, when they call a government office, are frustrated and they want answers and they want you to fix it and they want you to fix it now. And I think the most frustrating thing for me, and I talk, the mayor and I were talking about this on the side, is that we don't have the ability to fix it. So the state has taken over local control. And I think what angers me is, how many of you knew that happened? How many knew that there was legislation to take away state, the county? So did you write letters to your representative telling them not to do it? Okay, well you all are the exception, not the rule. And I will tell you that. And I love, I love the fact that there are people that are, that are keeping track of this kind of stuff because many did not know it. And so now we're playing catch up, trying to educate people that we're not happy. We're not happy because some of these projects, you know, I've got one in my district where it was threatening to be a seven story adjacent to um, uh, residential. And by right, there wasn't a darn thing I could do. And the community doesn't care. They want me to fix it. That's what I was elected to do. That's what I was elected to do. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call out the state and say, they need to fix this. They need to provide us with a voice, whether it be mandating that public hearings take place or that at least the size and scope of the project is conducive with the neighborhood. Um, these need to be included. So I'm waiting for a state legislator that's willing to step up and say, we made a mistake. Kind of like I did when I talked about the fact that with this program, not notifying about the NOVA funding, they need to step up and say, we made a mistake. We're willing to amend the legislation to give a voice to the community. Because by the way, your city council represents you, the community. I represent the unincorporated community. I represent the community. We need the authority to represent our community the way we were elected to do it. And that is missing right now. Um, so, you know, I've been fortunate in that um, I really do believe that collaboration is the key. Um, I tell people I will not compromise on my core beliefs, but I think what's wrong with government now is that you don't compromise and then you say it's my way or the highway. And lately the highway's been given to a lot of people um, I believe that there are ways to come to agreements when reasonable. But the question is, what is reasonable? And I don't have that answer because I want to hear from the community. And that's why when we talk about the community hearing that's going to be tomorrow night, I want to hear from the community. It's not up to me who does not live in that community. I live in Pasadena. It's up to me the community to tell me what are the concessions that they'd agree to, if at all. Recognizing that this is, public, this is private property, this is not county owned, 
and there's been comparisons to a project in another district um, that's Project Home Key. That's a motel, but that is a county project. That is a different project. Housing the homeless, definitely, but a different project. Um, on this one, it's very distinct. It's very similar to a project that's taking place right, I guess right next door, is it next door? Is it that way? The um, Larkin? Yeah, Larkin. Very similar to Larkin in terms of um, by right. And uh, you're not, you're not I, I'm with you. You don't, you don't know how frustrating this is for me because I kind of am one of these people that likes to fix things, especially when people aren't happy. I, I want to fix it and I want to make it better. And on this one, I'm not giving up by any means and I'm not walking away, but I just want you all to understand that the frustration you have is frustration that we all have as local officials. And, you know, COVID provided an interesting time for us as it relates to Sacramento because a lot was done that people have no idea. And that's why I'm really impressed that you all raised your hand and knew um, about this because there were a lot of things that had taken place that people were like, when did that happen? I, I didn't know it was happening. It happened. Um, so I'm going to continue to be vocal because um, you can blame me for a lot of things that I vote on, but you can't blame me for things that I have virtually no power to control. doesn't mean I'm going to be quiet or sit, sit quiet, but it does mean I'm going to really make it clear who you need to be reaching out to with me to educate about what needs to be done to change it. Because this is only one of many that are going to be coming through. Especially when you've got the arena numbers. Who knows what arena is? You guys are, the regional housing needs assessment. The state has mandated that we put housing in place in California. In LA County, 800,000 units, a little over 800,000 units are gonna be have to be placed in the next 10 years. In the unincorporated area, 90,000 mandated by the state. Now, I think the formula is being challenged, but I don't think the numbers are going to change that much. That's not true. Huh? They're going to, the, the numbers are overinflated by two thirds. Right. By two thirds, that's a huge, so. No, I know, but, but the state is, made, so yeah, because I sit on SCAG, which is. Mm -hmm. And their numbers are wrong too. Well, SCAG adopted, yeah. uh, no, I yeah. believe, yeah, it, it, was, it was a hot mess, all right? Um, but, but make no mistake where it came from, the state, mandated those numbers down. SCAG had to certify them. There was pushback. SCAG is Southern California. Yeah. It's where all the mayors, all the chiefs and no Indians go for meetings and, and it's all the mayors, supervisors. Well, it's mayors and supervisors. I think that's, yeah, mayors and supervisors. Anyway, from, all, from LA County, Orange County, Riverside County, uh, all, uh, many counties. And um, so there was a lot of debate on this and a lot of pushback. Um, but the state provided the formula and provided the numbers. SCAG agreed to it, um, and we agreed the numbers were inflated. But as of right now, I know that there's, I think, pending legislation. I'm looking to a niche, or maybe, um, I think it's pending legislation to rethink that number. SCAG is also working on a reader reform. Yeah. Effort. So we're. Yeah, so SCAG is working because we recognize that. But 90,000 units in unincorporated, 800,000 in the county. You know, we've got this infrastructure, bipartisan infrastructure bill. I mean, one of the things that comes with housing is building infrastructure around it. We don't have enough money to build the kind of infrastructure that's going to be needed to support that kind of development. Um, and so, you know, and, and not everyone's going to get out of their cars, especially if they don't feel safe. Um, which is something that, that uh, when I talk about the gold line, um, I will say, I will continue to say, ambassadors serve a purpose. If you don't know where you're going, they can kind of steer you in the right direction. But law enforcement cannot be replaced with ambassadors. And when I talk to ambassadors, because I've asked them, guess what they tell me? The only way they can do their job is if they have law enforcement. So I will continue to push to have law enforcement visible presence on our system because I think we all have a right. Yeah, we have a right to
you have a right to um, access transportation and feel safe. And right now, and I, I'm the only one on the board, and it really irritates our metro um, director, but I've said it publicly, I would not ride metro right now by myself. I would not. Um, I, I literally um, went to a noise within in Pasadena, which shares a parking structure with metro. And I parked my car, and I had to leave early. And this was very stupid of me. So all you women, take warning. I had to leave early. And I walked to get to my car, and there was nobody around. Nobody. A lot of homeless. In, when, I, and when I was going in there, there was homeless in the um, elevator, but I was with a woman, so we got in the elevator and I, we were, you know, together. So when I'm walking back, I knew I wasn't going to get in the elevator. And the stairwells, thank God, were on the outer side, so they weren't inside. So I, I knew I could climb the steps. My heart was pounding. I've never been more terrified in my life. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm pretty strong. I have three older brothers, so I'm a survivor. But I will tell you, it scared me the heck out of me. It truly did. And I was mad because I looked for security. There was no security. Nowhere to be found. I got to my car, and, um, and, and there are a lot of people that are doing naughty things there. And Noise Within told me that they when they are doing concerts or plays, people are breaking into the cars while they're in the concert. So I came back to Metro, and I, I raised Holy Living Hell. Because you want people to ride. And I'm a director, I won't go on the trains, and now I won't park in our parking structures. And um, what in the world's going on? Well, it turns out, um, I was told today that the contractor, um, no one was checking to find out they were actually doing their job, and they weren't. And so they picked the wrong day to go on break together and not show up. Seriously. Because they, they literally were back on duty about half an hour after I left, um, but it was a half an hour too late. And so I told them I'm gonna be arriving at parking structures throughout my district, and I mean it, checking to see where security is. Because that's not the way it should be. And by the way, the homeless hanging out there in the elevators now are doing it because they know that there's no security. Um, and so I'm digressing, but I just want you to know that when it comes to law enforcement and public safety on our trains, um, I will continue to fight for it. And anyone that wants to take them off can, um, well, I won't tell you what they can do, but they're not, they're not, they're not going to get my vote. That's all I have to say. And I believe that the Metro Board is now seeing the error of their ways because we are going to be discussing the security contract on our trains. And there is a recommendation to increase transit security, which is good news. But how that's done, um, Lindsay Horvath, my colleague, who I'm, I get along with, um, said the reason why she voted no on the contract is because it's the status quo. And she's right. If the status quo is not working with law enforcement, maybe we need to rethink how we are deploying law enforcement on our trains. And I will give her that. I will concede that maybe it's time for us to think about how we are doing it. Because obviously, um, you know, at least once a week, I hear on the news a story about someone who's attacked on one of our trains or at one of our stations. And that doesn't do anything for our ridership. And when I talk about the gold line coming here, it probably doesn't make you all excited to think you can take it all the way down to Long Beach, does it? But it'd be nice if it was safe and nice. Well, Long Beach is not bad. We've got the Aquarium of the Pacific, for God's sake. <laughs> but seriously, you, know, I, I, that you want alternatives. You should be able to have, you should be able to choose. So um, with that, I mean, I know that there's not a lot of time. I'm willing to take one or two questions. And OK, I saw you talking. Go ahead. Uh, what uh, control do you have? Uh, you, you indicated that the state has a lot of control over what you do. On, on, the, on the land use, I'll tell you what I do. If there's a project and they don't meet the threshold on affordable housing, um, then it falls in, back into the counties, local jurisdictions. What these projects are doing is they meet the threshold, the state built in a threshold that if you build, I don't know, X percent, X percent of affordable housing, because it depends on how many units, that you can bypass local, you can bypass all local jurisdictions. Not all developers want to do that. 
they want to do at market. So those are the ones that will come before, come up before the county. Um, they have to seek approval from us. But to do buy right, um, or you have to have affordable under market housing included. And not everyone's willing to do that. The ones that are usually willing to do it are the, the nonprofits that are focused on um, affordable housing and, and, and preventing homelessness. So we still have rights, but this is all, uh, this is the new uncharted territory for us. Um, because we've never not been able to put condition, terms and conditions on projects based on community input. And um, if you haven't read, I would encourage you to read an article in the LA Times probably a month ago about a buy right in La Cunada. And um, they purchased the Christian Science property on Foothill and um, tried to work with the city. And the community said, absolutely no way. And um, the individual said that, you know what, we were willing to concede on certain things, high number of units, but if you're not willing to work with us, we're going to do the maximum, and we don't care what you say, you, there's nothing you can do. And they're right. And I feel for La Pinata because the residents are frustrated. Um, the developer's frustrated because he thought he agreed to some concessions, and then the city kind of said, we can't, we can't, the community is not going to accept it. And so he said, okay, well, if you're not going to accept it, we're going to do it our way. And I would really encourage you to pull that article because I really, I read it and I really felt that article painted the frustration that I think we all feel when it comes to some of these buy right projects. You get good people that want to work with you. And then you get people that are saying, I'm going to do it because the, at the end of the day, especially the for-profit, um, at the end of the day, they, they're there to make So, um, but we still have, matter of fact, we just, we have land use projects, coming, especially in my district, a lot, a lot, up in the North Valley. How, how much of the problems like the uh, homeless and drugs is related to the open border? You know, I don't, I, I don't know. I can tell you that one of the things that I do, because our district's a little, I say ours, because you know, our fifth district is a little unique in that I still believe law enforcement plays an important role when it comes to working with the homeless population. And so through our fifth district money, I funded outreach teams throughout the, throughout the entire fifth district. And these are teams that pair um, mental health, outreach, workers from LASA, and sheriffs to go out. And they go in under the bridges, they go, they go in areas where you, you want to come in contact with the homeless and try to get them off the street. So I believe in that, but I also believe in enforcement. So my attitude is we'll do the outreach, we'll guarantee you'll have a bed. It may be temporary, but we're gonna get you off the street. And if you don't accept it, then it's time for you to move all your encampment. Because I still think that quality of life issues for people that pay their taxes in a certain area, I mean in all areas, have the right to feel safe in their community, be able to walk their kids to school, um, or even walk their dog around the block and not see what I see on a daily basis downtown. And so, um, you know, I think that, that uh, I go out and talk to the homeless. And I was out in Arcadia two weeks ago, and we actually succeeded in getting one woman, woman who was living under a bridge um, to agree for substance abuse. She was addicted um, and had been homeless. And she agreed to go in and was take, taken to a, a shelter uh, for addict or a clinic for addiction, um, and she was she had family in Arcadia. Talked to a man that was at the park who declined services because the place where we were going to place him was in East LA, and his stepmother lived in Monrovia, and he didn't want to be as far away from her as he was because he periodically stops in and sees her. So, and then in Pasadena, East Pasadena, um, that's a similar similar situation. Um, you've got people that have some sort of nexus to the community, not always the case. Skid Row is the exception to the rule. Skid Row, they come from all over, and they end up on Skid Row, and that's really rock bottom there. But in the communities, for the most part, you, you'd be surprised how many have some sort of connection or have either have lived here and then became homeless, or have a relative or grew up here, moved away, and then felt safe coming back to this community. Um, but I don't know what the number of, of undocumented or illegals would be. 
I'll take one more question. Yeah. One of the problems that we have is uh, with the homeless shelters or the homeless permanent supportive housing is that it allows housing first, which allows drug use in the facilities. Yeah. And that is not helping the communities. It's not helping us to embrace the, these needy people. What can you say about that? So, and, and, and here's what I said, because um, Andy Bales was my appointee to the LASA Commission, which is the LA Homeless Service Authority. And he runs Union Rescue Mission. And Union Rescue Mission has a site on Skid Row, but also has Cable Canyon, which is for women and children that they take off of Skid Row. Um, and housed up, up in the canyon. And he is very much opposed to uh, housing first because he's seen on Skid Row especially, people coming in and if they're not clean, it's disruptive the entire situation and, and he feels that, it, um, that uh, it creates a negative, I don't wanna say force, but negative outcomes. Um, but then I've seen areas where you've got someone who's addicted that is in desperate need of housing, but is not willing to get treatment. And when put in housing first with wraparound service, I don't, I don't support just giving them a room and walking away and saying, there you go. I believe in getting them off the street and then doing intensive case management to try to get them into the services they need. I've seen that work too. But I don't think it's a one size fits all. I just, I, I don't, I've seen both sides and I will tell you my preference is to provide um, uh, mandated treatment. And under Prop 47, um, that took away our ability to do drug courts, which was the carrot or the hammer, where if someone got arrested, they had a choice between going to jail or going for treatment. And as someone, you know, my background working in the county was um, health and welfare. And so I know that if you, you need to want the help. But I will tell you, the first time it may not stick, but the second time, third time, it will stick. Um, but by not doing it at all, you're basically enabling individuals to continue to use and eventually end up on the street. And if you, you know, born and raised in the area, my father was a lawyer downtown. If my father saw what I'm seeing downtown, I can't even imagine what he would think. I see people shooting up on not not a daily but almost um i see people defecating at least once a month on the street i see i see things that i can't unsee taking place on the street and i for one am appalled that as a society that's okay um growing up if someone was lying on the street not moving you call 911. I will tell you, and if you want to come, I'd be happy to have you come down to my office and I'll walk you out. You watch people walk by people laying, not moving, and they don't even think, they don't even look twice. It's, that's every day. And um, that tells you to become desensitized and, and almost accepting of it. And when I tell people that, someone said to me, well, I've shopped at a Bonds in Studio City and people didn't realize there was a homeless per person sitting there who had, was deceased. And it took them about eight hours to realize the person was gone. But that's, that's what's wrong. It's not okay. And, um, and I truly do believe that um, I go out and face my accusers because when we do clean up, we get a notice. We usually get three days notice we're gonna be coming out. On that day that we go out, I want to be there. And when I go out and I talk to a, a husband and wife who um, the wife wanted services, the husband didn't. And I said, I'm not trying to be mean, but we're not going to give you notice next time. You have option. We've got a bed available that you can take today and we'll help you with your goods. Or if you choose not to, then you're not going to be sticking around here because the residents complain. They don't feel safe because they're trying to walk their kids to school and all your stuff is out taking over the whole sidewalk and they have no room to, um, they're not going to walk on the street. And so I believe enforcement plays an important role as well. But the housing first model is not ideal and I don't, I do not support organizations that say either you do housing first or you don't get the money. Um, I think that is, um, 
That's part of why we're in the situation we're in. So with that, I want to thank you. I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you in front, okay? I want to thank you all and understand this. I'm not passing the buck. I own it. I'm very engaged in this subject, and I want to thank Vicki Paul on my staff, who um, is in my San Davis office, who is front and center on this issue, and I want to thank her publicly because I know it's tough for her. She's frustrated. Um, but I'm not... I'm not walking away. I'm not saying, not my problem, go talk. We're all in this together, all right? And my goal is to work with Claremont, whatever I can do next door, but also on this project, because one way or another, if they cram it down our throat, it's there. And, that, and I, again, please read the article in the LA Times. It was front page about the story I'm locking out, and I truly think that really does, not I'm gonna get it to you, it really does spell out what's going on. So with that, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. I am, you know, I just real quickly want to, I failed to do this in the beginning, and so I wanted to do it real quick before I give it back to President Bueller. But uh, I failed to introduce my colleague and uh, I guess co founder of Active Claremont, Corey Kalaik, by Councilman Corey Kalaik. And of course, city manager at a period. All right, President Mueller, it's all yours. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight once again. Uh, we have membership applications in the back. John has them. $10 for an individual for a year, $15 for a family, and our uh, really good looking polo shirts are also available for $20. Catherine, I'd like to thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, a few little things, but moreover, you get one of our polo shirts. <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> I'm you. Thank you. Thank you uh, again for coming. We have a sign-up sheet in the back. If you want to get on our newsletter, uh, you can uh, sign up for that in the back also. We normally meet Thursdays at 7 o'clock. Uh, with our newsletter, you'll be able to see when our next meeting is. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you again.